everyone. I am so excited to talk to this person. She has an amazing career and just awesome. I'm like, just giddy. I'm excited. My name is Julie and I have vegetarians and meat lovers split table recipes podcast. And I interview people who have something to do with food. And then I also post my own recipes. So I have so much fun doing it. And I want to introduce you to Tara Teaspoon. Welcome, Tara. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So excited to chat with you. You have such an amazing career. Like when I was researching you, I was like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It has been a great adventure. It's I've loved, I've loved what I've been able to do for a living. That's awesome. So you're a cookbook author, a TV personality, and a blogger, and you've been on multiple TV shows about cooking. So you've done TV appearances. Yes, yes. I've been lucky enough to do it all, kind of share food and recipes in all those mediums. Yep. That is awesome. And we'll get into which shows, but why don't you tell us first, what are your cookbooks? You have two of them, right? Yes. So my first one was called Live Life Deliciously, and the tagline was Recipes for Busy Weekdays and Leisurely Weekends. And okay. it was my first baby and just a collection of all of my favorite flavors and takes on classics and everything I ever wanted to put in a cookbook. My second cookbook is Delicious Gatherings. And it's recipes to celebrate together. So in Delicious Gatherings, I was able to explore a little bit more about entertaining and gathering people around meals you want to share and recipes that are shareable, but easy enough for a weeknight dinner. So that was a fun, a fun book to put together as well. I love that you have the word easy in there because I have three boys and I I'm really busy, you know, and I do like to cook, but sometimes I just need something easy. I want it to be good and I want it to be easy. And so some people will be like wanting all this gourmet stuff. That's great. Okay. Maybe for Saturday or Sunday when you have a lot of time, but the reality of it is we need easy meals. We need easy meals. And I have to say, I do throw around the word easy, probably a little bit more than a novice cook might care to hear me say, but I think I've got a few tips for making cooking easy. I want to share the idea of having fun in the kitchen, enjoying your time in the kitchen, even though weeknight dinners are a chore and feeding yourself and your family can sometimes feel like a chore. So when I say easy, I do have that thought in my head that easy, if you make sure to number one, read through the recipe, get all your ingredients in place. Do what I, you know, mise en place, which is get everything in order and prepped before you start cooking. So if you take a few simple steps before you endeavor on any of my recipes, that's when I say, okay, this is going to be easy. But there is a little of that preparation, both mental and thought and physical preparation that goes into an easy meal that's not just dumping a few cans in a slow cooker. Right. And I mean, I think I, I know what you're saying when getting everything ready, because I've done things where I like don't have something ready. I'm like, OK, I'll I'll chop this while that's cooking. Sometimes that brings in the panic mode for yourself, like, <laughs> trying to keep up and you're like, oh, no, I can't do it. Or the dog is bothering you. The kids are asking you things. But if you have everything ready, it mm -hmm. makes sense. It's going to be less stressful for you because you work all day long and then you're making a meal. So you don't want to have more stress in your meal. Right. I think that's totally true, even to the extent of pulling those spices out of the cupboard and yes. pulling out your measuring spoons, whether yes. you put it in a little bowl or not, right? You're just, like you said, you think, oh, I'm going to start this soup and I don't need to add the mushrooms until halfway through the process. But if right. you don't have those chopped, yep, you're right. The dog needs to be let out. The kid comes in and says, and then you've got to turn the pot off and like it throws everything off, right? Yeah. Oh, I've had that too. And if you're anything like me, my, my spice cupboard is crazy. I mean, it's just yeah. crazy. And so like, I'm like pulling things out. Sometimes you have to pull out like 30 spices to get to the right one. I'm like, how do I have this many spices? But I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I feel you. Oh my gosh. It's so crazy. So I love that. And I also love the whole holiday stuff because obviously everybody's thinking about Thanksgiving yeah. right now. Yeah. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you too, on your website or in your book, do you have some favorite Thanksgiving recipes that you'd like to recommend? I certainly do. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thanksgiving. That is like the food marathon of the year, right? It is just one of my favorite meals to share and to make. And in delicious gatherings, I actually let's start with the turkey. 
Mm-hmm. I did a unique turkey. So working in publishing and working in magazines for many years, I have cooked countless turkeys. And mm-hmm. usually I'll do something classic or add a fun flavor or base it in something unique. And I think turkey should just be very simple and flavorful so that the gravy that you make from that turkey is delicious. Mm, And so that your sides can really shine. But in delicious gatherings, I wanted something that would be faster. The turkey Mm. is usually the thing that takes the longest and the most work. So I have a recipe where I cook the turkey in pieces. So you can cut it into pieces or your butcher can cut it into pieces and you cut it into five large pieces lay it on your baking sheet and roast all those pieces. It is glorious. The skin gets nice and golden. The meat gets perfectly cooked and it's almost in half the time. So that's my big turkey uh, call out. I I love it. And so since I've created that recipe, we've been doing that as a family for many years. Um, And then I have to say, the sides for me are what shine. And I've got some miso honey Brussels sprouts in my Mm. book, the rolls, dinner rolls. I mean, you you can't be beat with just some classic dinner rolls. I'm looking in my book right now and cranberry sauce is another staple. Mm -hmm. And often it's cooked with a lot of sugar and it's this almost like jam, right? And it's delicious. But I did a fresh cranberry sauce, which Mm -hmm. sounds so interesting. I blended fresh cranberries or frozen in a food processor and chopped them up and added orange zest and orange juice and a little sweetener. And it makes this almost like a fresh relish. It's so good. Yummy. (laughs) Yes. Well, and I could go on. I mean, next would be the pies. And I love bringing in, you know, I think there should be a pie per person at Thanksgiving. (laughs) I know, right? When you want leftovers, right? I mean, everybody wants the leftovers. So It's not bad to make more pies. Oh my gosh. Isn't that what we do? Pie for breakfast the next day. And then that's that's a thing. That's a thing. Pie for breakfast. I've heard many people say that. I'm like, it's not just me. (laughs) We can just really dive into that pie for breakfast thing after Thanksgiving. I love it. I know. Absolutely. So when you were making your cookbooks, what, what drove you first of all, to want to make them? And was it more arduous to make than you expected? Great question. I had been a food editor at magazines for over 10 years. And I thought, oh, I could write a cookbook. I've been publishing (laughs) recipes professionally every month in these monthly magazines. I could absolutely, it'll be so easy. And I will tell you, it knocked my socks off. It was much harder than I thought it would be. And while creating the recipes was a joy and one of the best parts, I think for me, it was very hard to figure out the flow of the cookbook, the organization of the cookbook. And once I got all these wonderful recipes created, I was like, oh, wait, I need this kind of recipe to round this chapter out, or I need this kind of chapter. And you get so far into the process. And I wanted the book to be a beautiful journey and be able to flip through the pages and really get into the book instead of just having it piecemeal. Yep. So for me, that was tricky because it wasn't just a story about the best mashed potatoes that I would yeah. put in a magazine. It was one mashed potato recipe and then things that go with it. And how do you put that together in a meal, a dinner, something accessible for people? So it was a challenge. <laughs> it really is. And then, so how many times do you generally make your recipes before you decide, okay, this is it? Is it or is it different for every recipe? Oh, it's absolutely different for every recipe, for sure. Certainly, there are things like maybe a cookie or a vegetable side dish or a salad that you can put together and have. I have a vision. I've written down sort of a skeleton of a recipe on paper, and I can make it once. It's great. And I send it off to a friend or my mom or somebody to cross test it. So I've made it maybe once, right? And then I was just talking with a friend the other day. There was a recipe in Delicious Gatherings for a lemon pound cake. Okay. And I made that over 16 times to get it perfect. <laughs> yeah. And I just made, you know, because when you're developing something, you only want to make one little change each time you make it to see right. how it reacts, especially with a baking recipe because of chemistry. Yep. And so there's your spectrum. I mean, sometimes it's <laughs> once or twice and other times very rarely it's 
16 times. <laughs> <laughs> and that's brutal. But yeah, you're right. You need to do it. And then you also have to have it look nice yes. for the pictures. I mean, yes. that's the whole thing too. Now, do you do your own picture or do you hire a photographer? A little of both. So for my cookbooks, I hired my friend who is a professional photographer mm-hmm. and he is so talented. And so Ty Meekum is his name and he photographed both of my cookbooks. And I did the food styling, which is making the food for the photography. Mm -hmm. So it was a great team effort. And I also brought in my friend, Veronica, who is a prop stylist. So she was able to pull all the beautiful props and the linens and the dishes. And we worked as a team. When I create content for my blog, I often will be shooting it myself. Sometimes I use a fancy camera. Sometimes I use my iPhone. Right. (laughs) <laughs> yep. And I do the prop styling and the art direction and all of that. So it's a mix. It depends on what I'm shooting, what I'm working on. But for the most part, my books are professionally uh, shot. And then my blog is often me. Exactly. that, And that's really fun because you get the full gamut of doing things. You know, yes. I think that's really yeah. cool and really fun. So tell us some of the magazines you've worked for. And also, you're also a trained chef, right? So tell us a little bit more about your background. Yeah. So my training, really, I went to a traditional university. I went to both BYU and Utah State University. And between the two, I got my degree in culinary arts and I minored in journalism, knowing that I didn't want to work at a restaurant. I thought, oh, I would love to get into publishing. Yeah. And so that really propelled me into the world of publishing and I did an internship at Martha Stewart magazine. So cool. That was, yeah, it was amazing. It was not to date myself, but it was over 20 years ago. And Mm -hmm. when the industry was very robust and Martha Stewart was the place to be. So it was a great after school education, but my internship turned into a job. And so I became a food editor at Martha Stewart living magazine. Yeah, it was really amazing. I got great experience learning recipe development and food styling and publishing and TV, all aspects of food media. And after that, I I was there. (laughs) I mean, I often joke, I was there until she went to jail. Oh, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And then that sort of made me think, okay, maybe I should move on. Right. (laughs) But I left Martha Stewart and just did some freelance work. So I was able to do food styling and recipe creation for different publications, for other people's cookbooks, for mm-hmm. advertising. And a few years later, Ladies Home Journal came to me and said, hey, oh. you know, we're looking for a new food director. And so after quite a few months of back and forth at work that I became the food editor of Ladies Home Journal magazine. And it, yes, it was fantastic. So Ladies Home Journal was one of the seven sister magazines. They Mm. called those women's lifestyle magazines, the seven sisters. And it was, you know, Women's Day, Good Housekeeping, Ladies Home Journal, you know, Red Book. Yes, classics. Mm. And Mm. those magazines really changed the way women cooked and ran their homes. And it just was sort of education. Those pages had articles and inspiration not just about food, but for everything. And it was so fun to be part of that legacy of lifestyle magazines and be a part of that. Yeah. That is amazing. I mean, just to be a part of that and think about how many people, women in particular, I'm sure some men maybe we have read read it, read it too, but think how many you've influenced. I mean, that's just phenomenal. I mean, that's a a great, I don't know what they call it, footprint in your, in your life. I mean, that's just amazing. Yes. It was a great experience and I learned so much from both publications. They were ran very dif- run very differently. Uh, and I think I got a lot of great experience sort of speaking to the masses yeah, and sharing my food and recipes with the masses. And so when I mm-hmm. transitioned from publishing to writing my blog and doing my own thing, mm-hmm. I still wanted to share with a lot of people. Yeah. And that's what turned me on to starting my own blog because I was just sharing my recipes with a few friends and family. And, you know, I would just get people saying, Oh, do you have a recipe for this? Oh, do you have a recipe for this? And I thought, you know, I'm used to sharing 
all of this with so many people and how can I do that? And so it turned into my blog. Well, that's perfect because yeah, it's always there. People can, I mean, you know, you can be in the grocery store and be like, oh, wait, what did I need for that recipe? And you can pull it up. You know what it's, I mean? Yes. It's <laughs> such a cool day we live in, isn't it? It is. It really is. Now, so basically you're, you now moved into the era of your career where you're your own boss, right? So you're like your own business. How do you like that? I like it and I don't. <laughs> But in bad things about it, I never set out to be an entrepreneur or run my own business. And while I'm doing it, and I'm really proud of what I do, it is daily challenge to wear all the hats of being an entrepreneur yeah. and a creative person. So yeah, it's um, needing to create that content and go into that artistic mode and creation mode, and then switch over and do accounting and marketing and yes. emails and business and estimates for clients and all of that. And it's it's a challenge. It's hard. It is. I mean, you can hire some things out, but yeah, you end up doing, you end up just doing everything at some point or another, you know, even yeah. if you hire something out for a while or, you know, a part of it, you still end up doing something. Yes. So in saying that, where do you tend to like publish your stuff? Do you use Pinterest or what's your biggest social media platform that you are presenting stuff to the masses through? Pinterest is always there. I'll say that you mentioned it. And active on Pinterest. All my content is on Pinterest. I'm mostly my face and me and my engagement is on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Yep. And so I'm there. That's a great place to be able to engage with people and answer questions and share my newest content. But I will say as a business person, we're often told you don't own Instagram, you don't own social right. media. So I've really been focusing on my newsletter yeah. and that mm -hmm. has been so fun because it's so much more personal and yes. I can connect with people as often as I want and in a very personal way and curated way. So my newsletter is a big part of my business, but like you said, I, I do still publish in a lot of other magazines. So Better Homes and Gardens, Food Network Magazine, All Recipes Magazine, I will do little articles and things for those magazines as well. So that's still fun to do that. That's a great way also to reach more people and, you know, like, okay, you're just, you're reaching another potential audience yes. when you do that yes. kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So important, but yeah, yeah. it's very arduous and we don't own these social media platforms, but that's another reason to be on multiple. Yes. Also, because <laughs> so I feel like, I always feel like Pinterest is like a slow burn, you know, like yeah. it's, it's just, it takes a while. It's a slow burn and other, other platforms aren't that way, but mm -hmm. it's good to be on multiple. And then you have YouTube as well, right? I have a YouTube channel and that's where I put all of my videos and things like that. And, but I don't focus on creating content just for YouTube. Yeah. Um, I really just want to create content that can live in one place on my website. Everyone can go there for videos, for recipes, for tips and content. And then all of the other things are sort of just little outlets that help yeah. people get to teraspoon.com. So yes, I'm on YouTube and of course I'm on TikTok, but I don't yeah. like TikTok. <laughs> I know. But it's good to be there. You, someone be might there. bump into you, right? You know? <laughs> yes, it's like, hey TikTok, come on over to teraspoon.com. <laughs> yeah. And again, like you said, then you own your website. So you, yes. you know, someone's not gonna all of a sudden decide, oh, you're out. I'm gonna kick you out, you know, yeah. whatever reason. Or your engagement goes down. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when you, or did you start your website? Have you been doing it for many years or is it relatively new for you? Oh, well, started my website coming up on my 10 year anniversary. Nice. It seems Congrats. crazy. And <laughs> it seems crazy to me because it's always been only one arm of my business. So for several years when I started it, it was sort of on the back burner. I was oh. doing client work. I was creating recipes for food brands and I was doing food styling and I was, and my blog just kind of was something that I could contribute to and share when I had time. Right? Yeah. When I had time. Yeah. And so it was quite a few years until I started treating it more as a business and my primary mode of sharing content. So I don't often think of it as being 10 years old. It is, but I probably have been working on it um, probably about six or seven years more robustly. Yeah. And that's a whole thing to learn too. And and I think, I feel like in this day and age, all this technology, that's a challenge too, being an entrepreneur, because you're constantly new 
technology. You're keeping up. Oh, this is new. You got to try this. Oh, you got to go this way. It is, it is a lot to keep up on. Oh, Julie, it really is. And I've told a lot of people, it feels like I've gone back to school the last yeah. 10 years. I've had to self-educate. I've gone yeah. to conferences. I've, you know, read manuals. I've taken courses in mm -hmm. order to run my business online. Because when I was an editor, we had a web department. We yeah, had yeah. somebody that ran Pinterest. <laughs> we had a photo department. We had all of these, mm -hmm. the infrastructure to support me as the food editor. So yeah. when I created my own business, oh, suddenly I've got to learn keywording and SEO and backend mm -hmm. website management and all of this stuff. Yep. And it was a lot. It's been a constant education. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's rewarding. But like you said, it's, yeah. it's constant. It's often changing, yes. you know, trying to keep up new things come out, all the AI stuff now, you know, like it's, yes. it's definitely crazy. I would love to know a little bit more about what it was like being on the TV shows and doing the spots. How was that? Was that fun for you? Was it painful? Was it kind of a joy? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what I, funny enough, my first foray to television was with Martha Stewart herself. I, so as a food uh -huh. editor, yeah, it was it was crazy. And I, I didn't realize the impact of it at the time. When I was an editor at the magazine, they often would ask us to go on TV with Martha and to share some of our recipes and things like that. So I was asked to share some of my recipes and go and demonstrate them with Martha on her television show. And I didn't think much of it other than, oh, I've got to make sure I know my content and I can be presentable and right. <laughs> they gave us a script and you know what's funny is those first few episodes with Martha we had a script and it would say Tara says this Martha says this Tara says this oh. and we didn't have to follow it exactly but we knew what topics or questions we would be asking and answering mm -hmm. so that the flow of the show went well yeah well, Julie I get on there Martha started stealing all my lines oh my god <laughs> So I didn't have anything to say. Oh, I <laughs> so, think on your feet. Yes. Yeah, so that was my first experience having to improvise on TV and to, you know, sort of jump in and be like, okay, my line is no longer there. What do I say? How do I keep this going? So that was just, <laughs> I look back and I laugh because she, she was in charge. She could do yeah. whatever she wanted. And she was just kind of taking it and running with it. But after I did several shows with Martha, then I started to do a little bit of national and local TV. So I was lucky enough to be on the Today Show and mm -hmm. up here demoing recipes and talking about food products and all this fun stuff. And I loved being on the Today Show yeah, as a food editor. Yeah, it was so fun. I was on quite a few times. Um, and I've done local TV. So my family lived in Utah for many years and okay. I would do local TV shows there. I've done some Fox news out here in New York. I then let's talk about the pandemic during the oh, pandemic. Okay. Yeah. Suddenly, yes, all these local TV shows needed content. So we would zoom in. So I had to figure oh. out how to light myself at my home and yes. demo for zoom to go to Chicago or California or wherever it was zooming in, into. So yeah, I've kind of been all over the place with TV. You have. <laughs> what a journey that is. I mean, not everybody can say they've been on these shows, you know, like that's yeah, pretty cool. It's so fun. It's been great. <laughs> yes. Do you, do you still seek that kind of stuff out? Or are you kind of focusing in a different way? <laughs> <laughs> well, as much as I say, it's fun. I, I don't like being in front of the camera. It's, yeah. I consider it part of my job. But I get very nervous. I have stage yeah. fright and I sort of turn into a different person. I sort of say, okay, Tara, you've got to go into TV mode now so that I don't have that stage fright. So yeah. honestly, like you said, do I seek it out? Not very often. <laughs> well, you don't really need to, you know, I mean, you no. have other ways that you're yes. out there. <laughs> yeah. So if it comes to me, that's great. But I do every once in a while when I had my cookbooks were launching or I have a big oh. sort of content event, then absolutely I will pitch that to TV stations because it's a great marketing tool. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And just like there's, you know, kind of the whole TV market has exploded. We have all these cable channels, all these subscriptions, there's subscriptions. There's just so much out there. 
that people can access. So it definitely is a great way to to spread it around. Yes. And podcasts. I love that you brought me onto your podcast because that is a great fun way to share my content with other people. It really is because you can reach more people. And, you know, really cool thing about, I think, podcasts is that you see the list of them all. You go to that, you can see the list of them right there and you can go to them and listen anytime you want. So it's just like this directory. You're like, hey, look at this, look at that. You know, it's, I think it's It's great. It's fun. It's great. Yeah, (laughs) It really is. So do you have any like secret tips you can tell us about anything? I mean, any kind of, (laughs) I always like to ask people what they're, they're, because, you know, most people, who cook have ideas or they have tricks that work for them mm-hmm. that are just really valuable. Oh gosh. I Well, we could start in on another hour there, but <laughs> I think there are a few things that I like to share with people that maybe don't enjoy cooking or say, I would like to learn to cook more, but you know, I don't know how, or it seems like a daunting task. Um, so there are a few things that I like to say, get the right equipment in place start outright, set yourself up for success, have a set of sharp knives and keep Mm -hmm. them sharp, have a great cutting board, have a nice set of pots and pans or some of the basics. You don't need to have a giant test kitchen like I do with every piece of equipment, but just giving yourself the opportunity to be, like I said, set up for success, get some basic tools, a few gadgets that you know you'll use and then you can start cooking and enjoying it because you have the right tools to create what you're, what you're making. And the other thing we talked about spices earlier, and it just made me think, (laughs) I think we have a tendency. I love flavor. I love adding new and unique flavors to different dishes and spices are often that easy way to do that. But I think we keep our spices too long. So sometimes we'll be like, oh, "Oh, I know. Yes. So I we think oh, I'm guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Our food isn't as flavorful as we want or, you know, whatever. Go through your spices about every six months to a year. And I know some chefs and aficionados will say three months to six months, but Ooh, okay. it's okay to change them out after a year or so, but just <laughs> right. do go through them. Like if you open up that dried basil oregano and it doesn't smell like dried basil or oregano anymore. Right, right. You got to throw it out and get some new stuff. Same with all those spices like cinnamon and ginger and allspice. Now that we're coming up on holiday baking, if yours don't smell potent and fresh, they have lost their power. So your gingerbread is not going to taste delicious. So get some new spices, refresh those every once in a while. And I think that kind of helps people be so happy about what they've created and cooked. I think that's so true. And that's like something I don't usually think about. Like I think, oh, I have that in there, but I don't often know how long I've had it. You know, like maybe I need to start putting the date on there, you know, like in a Sharpie on the lid or something. We we would all be better off if we just tipped that spice jar over and wrote the date on the bottom, right? Right. And I do that for myself. Like I do it for like dressings and stuff Mm -hmm. and, and pizza sauce in the oven, not in the oven, in the fridge. But I never do it for my spices. And it didn't even occur to me until now that that's something that would be very beneficial to me. It would be helpful because we we do have all our senses. We have the taste and the smell to check them. But just knowing, hey, oh, this is two years old. I didn't even realize, you know, so that's a fun one. And then I would say, you know, I talked about it, having the right equipment and keeping your flavors fresh, but having a pantry with fun stock basics in both of my books. I have Mm. a page that talks about what I call pantry staples, Yeah, but they're, they're new. You think of pantry staples as like, oh, we've got cans of beans and flour and sugar and, you know, our chocolate chips, whatever. But I think new pantry staples can include things like sriracha sauce and different seasonings and make sure you've got that bottle of Worcestershire on hand. Oh, yeah. Things that bring a lot of umami and flavor in are now the new pantry staples, right? That's a great idea to think about and just make sure you have it, you know, and and they stay fresh. If you don't open them, you can have an extra bottle there when they're sealed, right? They're going to usually have a date on them. They can stay fresh for a really long time. Absolutely. But to just have it on hand, it can be so important. Yes. And then I think also one last thing would be to change up your grocery lists. And it goes along with this new pantry staples idea of bringing new and unique flavors into your home if you don't already use them. So I use things like 
always make sure I'm stocked with garlic, fresh ginger, oh, yeah. one or two fresh herbs in the fridge just to pump up a dish or two. Like if you throw something in the slow cooker, how delicious is it if you put some chopped fresh parsley or rosemary on top of it? And then, you know, if you don't use that rosemary up before it's going bad, throw it in with some roast chicken or Mm -hmm. let it dry and crumble it into a jar. So expense of these ingredients can be utilized more than we think if we just kind of change our mindset. I think other things that I keep in my pantry and fridge, maybe we didn't used to are coconut milk, you know, different broths that better than bouillon or different vegetable broths. And beef broths, things like that, capers, spices like turmeric and sumac and sesame seeds, different vinegars, balsamic, Mm, white balsamic, sherry vinegar. Oh, isn't that fun to think that, oh, I've got those flavors on hand and I can make something new and different. And where I am, I don't know, they probably have them by YouTube, but they have a lot of these stores where they have all these different flavored vinegars and oils. And it's so fun and the last time we went, I think they would still let you taste it, but COVID changed. They used yeah. to always have like yeah. their samples out. Now you have mm-hmm. to like go and specifically ask, hey, can I taste this? Mm-hmm. But it's such a fun thing to do. And it's amazing how many different flavored vinegars and oils there are out there. It's amazing. It, I mean, it changes your salad game. It changes your roasted vegetable game just by having yes. one of those fun ingredients that might think is a specialty ingredient, but it might become your new favorite staple. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I never used to use sesame oil. And when I'm making an Asian dish, now I use sesame oil and I'm like, oh, wow, this actually, it does change it. Oh, for sure. Isn't that fun to, you know, find one of those new things that you and your family love? I think it's great. We also went to one and they had a, oh, it was amazing. I think it was like an 18 year aged balsamic oh it's unbelievable i'm like we ate it so quickly i'm like wow this is a thing i was thinking of wine as being aged but vinegar vinegar that balsamic that aged balsamic vinegar i have to quickly tell you a story my friend owns the company oleopira which is a tuscan olive oil company and they just acquired a balsamic vinegar company from Mm -hmm. italy and so she brought me a tasting of balsamic Ah. vinegars And just that one drop of like a 24 year old balsamic (laughs) vinegar is, was incredible. Tasted like nothing I have ever experienced. And like you said, a 12 year old or an eight year old vinegar, it opens your mind and your palate to just something that you may never have experienced unless you just say, that is something I really want to try and explore. Oh, yeah. And, you know, just even tasting it by itself or putting it on a little bit of bread. I mean, mm-hmm. let alone using it in recipes. It's it's amazing in all of those ways. Oh, so fun. Isn't that? I just love it. I, just love it. I know. My husband and I did that as a date once. We went and tasted all these vinegars. Yeah. We, went to eat, we went and tasted all these vinegars. And I was like, this is really fun. Of course, we had to buy some. You can't go and not buy some, right? <laughs> <laughs> what a fun date. That sounds great. It was fun. It was really fun. So since we're at the holidays, how about Christmas? Do you have any special Christmas things you like to share or recipes? Well, I'm definitely a Christmas cookie gal. So my website is full of such fun Christmas cookies. Cookie swaps are often a big thing in people's neighborhoods. And Mm -hmm. so I say try something new. You know, I did a take on gingerbread a few years ago, and it's a honey cinnamon cookie, but it has the same texture as gingerbread cookie. But instead of using molasses and all the spices, I used honey and cinnamon. And it's just a delightful Christmas cookie to share and to make that's sort of a change from the norm. Um, I, of course, I love all the classics, sugar cookies and, you know, snickerdoodles and chocolate cake cookies and things like that with peppermint. Um, But take a look at my website, try a new cookie this year for the holidays. I just think that is so fun and festive and exciting. And for a holiday dinner, I, my family, we often do a a roast, a big roast with all the sides and twice baked potatoes and seasonal Mm. vegetables and squash. Mm. My thing for the holidays is I love to use seasonal food. You know, the the rich root vegetables and hearty greens, things like that. Isn't that so fun to now celebrate during the holidays? So anyway, uh, we can wait for spring for, you know, artichokes and asparagus. <laughs> yeah. But, right? right. So let's get in those pomegranates and 
butternut mm. squash and all those delicious things. So, oh yeah, yeah, I, I would butternut say squash. Try switching up your menu and try a new side dish for your Thanksgiving dinner or your Christmas dinner. Make a few new appetizers for New Year's or yeah. Christmas Eve. You know, get and here's a thought. My family is a mixed family. We've sometimes we have a vegan in the family. We have okay. somebody with celiac. So we often cook gluten-free. We yeah. have meat lovers. We have, it runs the gamut. So yeah. I think at the holidays, isn't it nice to think about sort of new menus that can feed a varied crowd? Yeah. So true. Um, true. Yeah. So I think just switch it up that way. Maybe you have something that's a little more main dishy. That's a vegetarian dish but make it so meat lovers can like it. You know, I have yeah. zucchini stuffed or ricotta zucchini ravioli where I oh, use the yeah. zucchini as the pasta and it's mm -hmm. vegetarian and also meat lovers love it. So mm -hmm. things like that, that you can create for a very crowd are great for the holidays. Absolutely. Now, do you have any special substitutions that you use? Like, you know, you know, people like maybe use applesauce in a recipe mm -hmm. instead of something else. Do you have any of those kind of things you like to do? Uh, you know, I don't love playing around with substitutes unless it's for a specific diet. And then sure. I have my go-tos because I think a recipe should be developed for the ingredients that you're using. Otherwise, right. you're not setting yourself up for success. Sure. But I do because I've dealt with these very diets. When you're making something dairy-free or vegan, I oh, love yeah. that oikos cultured butter. Oh, okay. I find that that butter substitute, you could use margarine as well, mm -hmm. but um, the oikos tastes like butter and it still bakes really well in your baked goods. So that's a great substitute. And then cup for cup flour is my favorite gluten-free flour. It okay. doesn't have too much cornstarch or thickeners, and it tends to be a really great one for one swap other than yeast spreads. Yeast spreads are okay. really tricky. You've got to have a really formulated uh, recipe for gluten-free yeast spreads. But those are some of the swaps I use. If you're trying to be low fat, that alpha sauce for the fat swap sometimes works. But I just think, you know, portion control or yeah. just having cutting things into smaller pieces is going to help with that like low fat during the holidays. I think it's really hard to make something super delicious with lots of different substitutes. Yeah, I think that's so true. I was talking about that with somebody recently and we're saying how sometimes you're just not even satisfied. You know, if you're mm -hmm. taking all that fat out, why not just eat less of it instead yeah. of completely removing it? Because you might not be satiated. You might yeah. find you're hungry again sooner, you know? So sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't always help the best. That's so true. Yeah, I've had those conversations with friends too. <laughs> it's just, how do we do this? How do we manage it? Exactly. Well, what are some things that you would like to tell people about where they can find you? And I know we've talked about a little, are you Tara Te Teaspoon all on those sites or do you have different app names? Yes, you can find me on pretty much every social handle under Tara Teaspoon and then my website, TaraTeaspoon.com. So it's that nice little alliteration, Tara Teaspoon, that you can remember yes. wherever you want to search for me. And then my cookbooks are available anywhere online and at a few bookstores. So delicious gatherings and live life deliciously. Those, I have to say, I, those recipes are not on my website. So the books okay. are the only place where you can find now with both books, it's almost, let's see, almost 250 recipes wow. that are unique to those books. I love them. I hope everyone, you know, will grab a book and try it out. Um, but yeah, I'm around and I would love if people commented on social media and said hello and that they heard me here with you. That would be so fun. Oh, absolutely. That's so much fun. Well, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with? Any tips or anything else you'd like to advice or anything that <laughs> <laughs> you've given us so much so far? So I know I've fun. rambled on. I've rambled on. Um, it's awesome. <laughs> you know, I just think I always... My premise is to help people enjoy their time in the kitchen. So if there's anything that I create or make or tips that I give, it's so that people might enjoy cooking as much as I do. It's not for everyone. For some people, it really is a day-to-day -day chore and task. And I just, for everything I do, every recipe I create, it's just one way that I am hoping people can 
find some sort of joy in food. So if you're not seeing that or you want more of it, let me know, comment on social media, send me an email because I want to talk about food. I want to enjoy food. I love gathering people around a meal. I think that is such a fabulous way to connect with people, with family, with children. And so that's what I'm perpetuating. Absolutely. 100% agree. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been a wonderful chat and I loved learning of all that you've done and all of your tips. So thank you. Thank you for having me. What a joy to talk to you. You have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.